Welcome to Mbogi Ya My Writers, a springboard for new writing from Kenya, coming to you from the media library of the Alliance Française de Nairobi. Soyez les bienvenus. <clears throat> We're going to start off with um, a show about a book, and it's right here in front of me. It's called Digital Bedbugs. It's a collection of short stories, 12 of them to be precise. And with us today, we will have seven of the writers who could make it to be here today. And because of the constraints of time, the very first person that I'm going to introduce is the editor. Now, an editor is the person who chooses and puts things together. And in this case, the editor is Makena Onjerika. Makena published her first novel, self-published it, when she was 17. She studied fiction, writing as an undergraduate at Amherst College in Massachusetts, that's in the USA. And she took her master's in fine arts with fiction as the MasterCard at the New York University. She won the Kane Prize for African Writing in 2018, and she has since trained 70 plus new and emerging writers through her writing workshop, the Nairobi Fiction Writing Workshop. Welcome. Thank you. Makena, it seems to me that you knew your calling sooner than most. Um, you didn't want to become a priest, it seems, or a nun. You no. wanted to become a writer. No, I actually did want to become a, a nun at some point. Right. Yes. So is the next stage from being a nun becoming a writer? A few other things in between, and a then a writer. So there was a lawyer, a judge, a politician. Yeah, a couple of those. Right, so you've brought, I'm interested in the Nairobi Fiction Writing Workshop. The trick question is, <coughs> is it possible to teach people how to write? And what is the process that has led to our anthology? So, I think you can teach people who have interest how to write or how to manage the process of writing. In this case, what I do is I train on craft. So if you're interested in understanding which elements you can use in your writing to make it better, I can talk to you about that. But I can't really talk to you about creativity. So if you don't have creativity, I probably cannot teach you that. Uh, if you don't have interest in writing, I can save you from that. Um, and what we do at the workshop is that it's a three-stage process. Um, the first stage of that is sort of a 10 weeks class focused around craft. Craft being what is point of view, uh, what is narration, who are narrators and that kind of thing. And then the next stage of that is an editing class where we focus specifically on you bring your stories into the class and let's talk about them and hear what we can improve about them. And then the last stage is actually the anthology, which is a six-month process during which the author chooses one story that they want to work with uh, from beginning to end, from sort of generation to perfection. Uh, that's basically the process. So that's the process. Now I'm going to talk about quality. Mm -hmm. uh, are, every time you have a class, you're going to produce a book such as this. This is the first one. Okay. So now, I, the, the main question, mm -hmm. is everybody in the book because they deserve to be in the book mm -hmm. or because they wrote a story and they're in the book? Okay. So the year I produced this, I actually put together three classes. So the, the, the workshop itself had already about 36 writers. And what I did was make a call and say, 
if you want to appear in the anthology, please send in your story. Are, so first of all, there's, there's a lot of people who never send in a story. So there's a process of self-elimination right. even before I get to the point where I say, uh, maybe your story doesn't work. Because there are people who we get to about month six and I'm like, <laughs> your story isn't going to come together. I'm really sorry. Um, so that happens as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a blend between you wanting to actually vigorously work on a story and me being like, I can see you've worked very hard, but it just doesn't work. I'm exercised by the absence of a theme. Mm -hmm. This kind of anthology normally says talk about childhood, mm -hmm. talk about something that really made you sad. It seems that there's such a disparate array of subject matter here. Mm -hmm. Why, through the teaching process, then to oblige everybody to write the same kind of story? Um, it's, it's more of a personal thing, actually, John. Every time there has been a call for a story and they, it's been a themed topic, I always fail to write the story, even with all the best of intentions. So I wanted to make the process a bit easier for my writers. What I wanted were stories that they had written. As long as you could get through to the end of the process, I was satisfied. Um, what has then resulted is that you have a very wide selection of stories. Uh, people are able to talk about topics you may not even generally talk about in Kenyan literature, and I was happy with that. Well, you heard my opening spiel about I'm going to sort of say hello and then goodbye. Yes. So I say thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. The first of the seven writers is a young gentleman called Dennis Muga. And I'm hoping that he's going to go through sort of winding corridors and end up sitting next to me. Um, and as he does so, I'm going to say something about him. Uh, now, I think, Dennis, you've been shortlisted for winning things. Uh, yeah, OK, it was, it was a call by someone, a Nigerian, who made a call about uh, young writers between the age of 18 to 25 to submit stories about uh, Afro-fantasy. It was, it was a call on, uh, on sorry, not Afro-fantasy, but it was about uh, African histories. Right. And then uh, you submit to him his, your story, and then he selects who he wants to shortlist or to longlist or something like that, yeah. Well, there are two forms of embarrassment, Dennis. One is to ask you to read your own writing, and, but the easier challenge is to have somebody read your writing to you as if you're going to bed or something. So I'm going to read the opening lines of Housewarming just to give our audience some idea of where you're coming from. Housewarming by Dennis Munga. Listen, I know how this sounds, but it wasn't me who killed the kid. There are things you may have heard people say about me. Wafula is a liar. Wafula is a thief. Wafula is a cheat. And Wafula is a killer. I'm all these things except a killer. When you're at short story writing school, as when I was at school, there's a big deal about how you get into the story. May I ask how many times you had to rewrite that beginning before you fell upon it as the one to go by? Um, strange thing is that uh, for this particular story, I didn't. Uh, it it came, it it came, uh, it came like all of it without the without the, the the general like you have to struggle through. through. It was delivered to you in a dream. Yeah. It came no, like no, no. tablets like from it's more of mountain. Like, it's more of like voice, yeah. like you, you, you get the voice of that person. Because I don't think the story more or less focuses a lot on craft elements, on a lot of different craft elements, like say, uh, timing, like uh, using past or present tense, it's just the voice. The voice is what carries the story. Right, so I've, from that opening, I've got the idea that somebody's going to justify why they did or why they did not and whether they were a suspect. Yeah. So there's a suspense story in there. Yeah. I'm also interested in going forward to the ending. Mm. Again, in the writing process, did you sort of think, um, this is what will get them? 
and work out at your ending? Or from that point onwards, did the story take on a life of its own? And so many words later, you said stop. I think one thing I've found uh, uh, throughout my writing process is that uh, sometimes stories choose where they want to end. You, as the author, may want, to, may want it to end this way. And then the story, went, as, it go, as you proceed with the story, you realize, no, it's not going to end this way. So you, you sort of obey the story. You, you let it take you there. So specifically, elements of ending, um, I didn't know how it was going to end like that. Like I said before, it was simply a voice which I was following through. So the ending when it came, it just felt like a finishing point where the story is over. And I also note in your short story that there's a, a constant reference to real life and a real setting. And you mention newspaper headlines. Yeah. And you say, on such and such a date, the headline said this and that. Again, in terms of the process, did you go to look for the headline, or did the headline come to look for you? And, and, <laughs> and did, you go to, did you go to sort of Nation yeah. House and say, on the 15th of December, there was a, this was the headline? I'm interested. Uh, so I'll give you like two stories, two separate stories. So for this particular story, uh, I, didn't, uh, I made up the headline. Oh, I you made, made up, up yeah, the headline? I made, I made up the headline. Do you have I, that license to make no, it up? Yeah, yes, To make do. up a reality uh, within a reality? Because then again, it's fiction you're writing. Okay. Yeah, so, but the setting is real. Yeah, but the setting is real. So okay. some, some, I think what is necessary is for the story to feel real. Less of it to be a lie or, to, or less of it to be a fiction or non-fiction. Uh, and then the other thing is uh, there are stories which demand you almost to keep to the, to, to the, to the history. Say, if you're writing historical fiction, uh, like there's a book by Maaza, uh, it's called The Shadow King. It's a very recent book. So throughout the story, she has to, she has to keep the elements. The, it has to be real. Like it has to be based on history, the things which happened. But one thing, watch, one major thing, which also, like if you're, if you're using research, uh, one thing is that the story should not feel like a history book. It should not feel like a, because even with, throughout this COVID period, it's a historical moment, but we're not living it as history. Like, we're just living our lives. Yeah. So I think that's one thing. When it, whenever you're writing a story based on research, it shouldn't feel like research. Yeah. So short, but so engaging. Thank you, Dennis. Yeah, thank you. It's number two, time for number two, Awar Mugeni. Uh, Awar Mugeni is a graphic designer in her professional time, but she has written a story called Our Husband. And again, this is your embarrassment moment, Awar. After Mama met John, she asked me if I loved him I said I wasn't sure. Good, she replied. You should marry him. Had I known any better, I wouldn't have listened to her. I would have run into the arms of Don, the man who actually loved me. But we are our parents' children, and in my mama's house, comfort and security came before trivial things like romantic love. So it seems to me that um, things are going to go awfully wrong 10,000 words later. But, Awar, you have chosen to address a taboo subject to do with sexuality. And I think to myself, for somebody of my generation, decades older than you, that there was such a thing as African culture, and there are certain things that Africans don't do, Africans don't discuss. Why do you feel that this is the moment to deal with the topic that you've chosen to deal with without spilling the beans in their entirety? Because I question. I question a lot and I actually question the fact that Africans didn't use to discuss such subjects because um, the history that has been brought down to me as a young person 
is one that was edited by those who colonized us. So how are we to know if we really did not discuss these things? And they have to be discussed anyway, because they're happening. Right, so you're thinking that they're happening. So you're basically saying it's within our culture to have relationships that are other than heterosexual. Yes. The, the natural union is man, woman, church. You, you discussed a great deal of Kenyans who would go and say they're either fundamentalist Muslims or fundamentalist Christians. You'd annoy them. So why, who would you expect to read your book if they're going to be offended by it? Or do you think that you're going to earn a new convert through writing? It, it, does, does, does writing carry a messianic quotient, a change quotient? Definitely has a change quotient. Because why then would um, the powers that be try to stifle writers if they did not, or if it did not? There is, culture is not, um, it's not a permanent thing. If I was to pick an example of the forum that you call it, Mbogiyama writers, what um, language? Language is a form of culture, but is it, is the word Mbogi Kiswahili, is it English? It isn't. It is a form of, um, it's an expression that has come through the mixing, the growing, the evolving of culture. So we cannot sit and say that culture is set in stone, it's not. It keeps growing. I will let the audience judge the wisdom of that remark. I want to ask you more about the, the structure. You have names of characters. There's John, there's Don, there's Wiki, and there is Jojo. Again, audience. Somebody might read that in Surrey or Kent and say the character's name was Wiki. Wiki. But I think for Kenyans, we probably, was it meant to be Wiki? Yes. It was meant to be Wiki, okay. So I'm asking you, when you had the choice of names, John and Don kind of rhyme, Wiki and Jojo, again, for the craftsperson, how much energy did you put towards naming your characters? And is that, does that make a difference to the final import of the story? I looked for names that are relatable. So I know a wiki, I know a John, I know a Jojo, yeah? So for most of my friends, or I'd say most of my peers, you'd know someone who has at least one name in this story. I didn't want to give names that are unfamiliar. And what about if the real Jojo sort of found themselves in your story? <laughs> Is there sort of a loss of a friendship there, or you don't care? I don't think there'll be loss <laughs> of a friendship. Thank you. I'm glad that friendships are being sustained. Thank you. <laughs> we are now going to call up Ms. Sana Jabin, who is a Kenyan of mixed parentage, and her story is called The Harmonium. She writes in the first person. And uh, there she is. Hi. Sana, I've just said you're Kenyan, but your story is set in India. Can you write about things you don't know? Or do you know India intimately and the setting of your story? Or was that, did you get onto a mental plane and go to India? Yes. And also, well, yeah, it's hard to write about something you don't know, but it's very much based in my roots and stories from my father's childhood and things that I've heard from. And so it connects to my roots that I have had to discover and I've, I thought the best way to discover my roots, since I'm probably not going to India, is through writing. Because the thing that I was asked as a writer is like, what's your voice? Like, who are you? And that's the question I get all the time. Who are you? Are you Kenyan? Are you Indian? What are you? I have no idea. 
So I, because it's all a mix. So I'm going to try it through my writing. And the harmonium is the first story that's based in India. And I thought, let's see if it hits a mark. Right. I'm going to read you your opening sentence. And again, there's a question to follow with it. Because the harmonium, again, in terms of, of craft, is becoming a symbol okay. that's going to be sustained throughout. And the fate of the harmonium and the relationship between the harmonium and the piano. So you've, you've gone to great lengths to, to make me at least understand that. The harmonium makes no sound without effort. Sonia, it gives only what you put into its 42 keys. And sometimes, if you're lucky, you can create life that is music. In, out, in, out, breathe, Sonia, breathe like the harmonium and watch the magic unfold. I thought there was going to be magic unfolding in your short story, <laughs> but there was no magic. There was tragedy and loss, and, yeah. and it's perhaps the weepiest story of all. Oh, well, Are you, you Miss Weepy? Or? Very much so. So a dark, a, a dark vision of the world. Very much so, yes. Expand. Well... The story came out of actually something personal where I was fighting with my brother when the story was actually due. And I was struggling to write and the story, as you know, is very much based on a brother. And my, my father plays the, the harmonium as well. And it just came out of a lot of grief. And the story of how, especially in the Indian culture, grief is transported through music. That's exact. So the guzzle itself, which is mentioned, is actually the music of sad people. That's what people call it. Right. This question is going to put, be put to other people, yeah. but uh, uh, you're the first. Sharwani, masala chai, guzzle, kagaz. Mm. You never told me what these things were. Yeah. Did you? And you never led me to suspect what they might be. Mm -hmm. Again, who's your audience? Who knows what a Sharwani is? So actually, that was, that was a discussion that we had with McKenna, and she made a very good point where she was like, why do we need to explain ourselves? In a lot of British novels, American novels, no one has to explain the context. But for some reason, when you're talking about a place that is not spoken about a lot, or cultures that are not spoken about, you must explain because you're writing for white people who may not understand. And so I thought that was a really good point because if you don't know what a Sherwani is, just like in um, A Suitable Boy, via Snipes, you'd actually just check what is a Sherwani. What By is Googling it, it. Yeah, or you know what, if you're reading on Kindle, there's a simple button and you check what it is. But I liked her point where she was like, why do we always have to explain ourselves? And I've seen that in a lot of our writing as a group, where we're like, we're going to talk about Kenya, and if someone is reading it, then they have to just make an effort to understand. Right, but I, I'm still... I'm, oh, oh, gosh, so people like that. <laughs> yeah. Thank so you. So this is our next candidate for president. Uh, you've, got your, <laughs> you've got your following. I, I'm still going to draw you on this idea yeah. of authenticity. Mm -hmm. And I sort of... Um, we asked McKenna whether, whether, whether writing can be taught. So you, as a Kenyan, mm -hmm. writing a story set in India, yeah. where is your authenticity spot? In yourself as a writer or in your audience? You know, I don't have one yet. I haven't found my voice. No, I think I've a... done a lot of stories, and McKenna's seen them, where I've tried to write based in Kenya, and it doesn't feel like me. And even the harmonium story, I've never been to India, so that doesn't feel like me. The only thing that's truly authentic is the characters and the emotion, but my setting is all messed up. Right, so I, I like the fact that you're talking about the emotion speaks to our essential humanity. Yeah. So you're saying that with this sad story, the sadness can communicate itself across yeah. boundaries it's against universal. cultures about uni the universality. Yeah, it of is language. definitely universal, and I think that's why different writers are able to communicate it. Whether you're reading an Indian author, a French author, anything, when even if the writing is difficult, right? The point is, can the emotion come through? Well, they, there has to be one last question, sure. and that is in the choice of language. Mm -hmm. Are you writing for the man in the street? or the one man or woman with a double PhD, now that you're authentic, the register, the linguistic register, you... 
Who are you pitching it to? I don't have an answer to that. I was writing for my family here online. Oh. Yeah, I was so, writing. But, but it's interesting because um, who's this uh, Hilary Mantel, mm -hmm. uh, who's like famous Brit author, yeah. uh, being shortlisted for this, that, and the other, said basically you write for yourself and hope that an audience will find you, mm -hmm. not write for an audience and pitch it to that audience. Would you agree with that? I definitely form? agree. I think if you're writing specifically for an audience, you, be, you belong in the advertising industry as a copywriter. Mm. But if you're writing for yourself and a story... Any copywriters here? Oh my goodness. I'm uh, a copywriter too, so I know. Okay. So that's how I know. But if you're doing it for yourself, then yeah. You know what? Even if no one reads it, you did it for yourself, and that's awesome. Thank you very much. We now have a young lady called Gladwell Pamba, and her story is called The Night Runner. And perhaps Gladwell would be so kind as to join me. Uh, here she is. Hello, Gladwell. Hello. I am going to find the night run on page 119, and I'm going to flip through and get to a page where this will happen. Dumbu dumbu ye masi, se ya ko merata, hafu ana ka hako ho, woi woi, amba ma, amba papa, amba na ko fiala, amba wosi. <laughs> now, since this is one of the hundred languages which I speak, uh, I actually understand what you're saying. But again, what language is that? And no explanation. What language is this? It's Cabras. It's a Cabras. Yes. May I ask, the, there it is in, in pink for all who can see. There is no effort to explain what that means, except for a sort of encapsulation that says, we repeated the song that called everyone to come and witness the shame. So it's a shame calling. What of your audience? What, why, did, why did you allow those one, two, three, four, five lines of print to survive? Um, first of all, when you're writing, um you are translating from, so when I write the story, I'm translating from my mother tongue. So it's, sometimes I feel like when I translate too much, I will lose the meaning, so I just could not translate the song. But I'm, I'm interested in, in, in your reader. Have you no feelings for your reader? <laughs> <laughs> they would understand the context. You think so? Yes. Okay, I wouldn't pursue that any further, but this is how you start. The blackness of night made him fidgety. His wife suggested that he go out to drink busa with fellow men to kill time. That way, he would stagger home at midnight. By the time he crossed the three bridges, if he managed at all, it would be minutes to 1 a.m., and he would be too tired to go disrupting the sleeping village with his runs. He needed her advice. But by the third round of Koro Koro, he was still alert to his calling. What is a night runner? It's a person who's possessed and runs naked at night. And it's a spell cast on them. So again, in terms of research, why do you have a PhD in night running? <laughs> Uh, I've, grown, I've grown up in the village, and night runners were a common thing. Right. Yeah. You write as if you, you, you believe in the possibility of this possession. You, you, you do write that, you know, if one goat is slaughtered, or, then everything will be fine. Are you communicating that belief to your reader? But it's true, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, okay, so, well, uh, I, I, I must say uh, that I, <laughs> I don't have any personal experience of <laughs> night running, but um, if, you, if you say so, 
Uh, I'm, I'm interested in this idea of imagery and bringing things to life. So uh, when we were at school, we had a book called The uh, Student's Companion, and it gave you English idioms, a stitch in times, saves nine, hurry, hurry, has no blessing. And to know the English language was to be familiar with these uh, images. But you say, my stomach was a hot piece of charcoal. And then, my stomach was a loud isikuti drum. Those images, where did you draw them from? The setting of the stories in the village. Right. Yes, and uh, the narrator is exposed to those things. When you talk about if your stomach, you're feeling it's really hot, you will associate that with charcoal and not fairness or, yeah, they're, that's what they're Agreed, familiar Agreed, Manuel, with. but we're talking about the writer's craft and you're thinking about a way of really making something come to life. You're saying that you chose images that were in synchronicity with your setting. Yes. So in other words, if you're not in a Cabras village or if you've never had a car charcoal burner, you wouldn't understand that image. You wouldn't say it was as bright as the Aurora Borealis. It had to be in Cabras. All your images came from Cabras. Uh from the village setup, what you you will be exposed to some of these things. So that typically, when you're choosing, yes. that's the images you would choose. Right. I hope I'm not getting excited and overrunning my ten minute thing, but I, I do feel I have to ask you something else about your story, and that is the idea of creating characters that are actually going to have a life of their own. We have names which you introduce to us. We have Mutendi, we have Saulo, we have Injendi. We have all these names, which could either be male or female for the person, but we know nothing about that beyond the name. Aren't you shortchanging us by not giving these people an individual identity by writing another, let us say, 2,000 words for each one, to cover each one? It would be an overload um, because we are focusing. You have to choose your focus. So that those are people. There are people that br branch from from the narrator. So that's why they are mentioned. But you don't have to go. I didn't have to go and give my readers all the information. It will be overloading them. Right. It's interesting because I wish there's an author in the anthology who does the exact opposite, who introduces a character and says um, she went to school in Form 1, failed CPE, and now she's in Hashamba Diggy. So obviously, uh, there are different ways of looking at it. But um, Gladwell, thank you very much. Cool. We are now into the second last one, um, and I hope that um, uh, I will be joined, should be joined, could be joined, would be joined by Sophie Gitonga, and uh, miraculously uh, she has she arrived. She appears. Right. Now, Sophie. Yes. You were a precocious writer. You wrote from a very young age. Um, you write about food, unrequited love, but you only took writing seriously of late. What is a serious writer as opposed to a charlatan? <laughs> um, I think for me, when I think of myself as a serious writer is one that finally gets published like this. That makes me feel all grown up and serious. Right. Yes. So tell us about the journey that led you to this level of seriousness. If you had grown up to it, I'm still mm -hmm. asking about going to a workshop. Uh, you go to McKenna. She's the real deal. She's got the gold badge and everything else. But you've already been writing. But I ask what you've gained from the workshop. Um, a little pitch for the workshop. Yes. Um, I think the, the very first thing is the sense of confidence in my writing. I think previously when I wrote, I didn't think it was the kind of thing that anybody would be interested in reading. But going to a workshop kind of 
even being selected for the workshop is in itself a boost as a writer because there were many applicants and I happened to be one of those who was selected. So that in itself gave me the sense that maybe I could be one of those who created something that people would enjoy. I'm going to, the, the sense of intrigue for you is that you haven't chosen the first person I, mm -hmm. you haven't chosen the third person he or she, you from the good old grammar have chosen the second person singular. It's a you narrative. Mm -hmm. If I may read a burst to our uh, gathered audience. The driver in a car outside his place revs the engine, drawing excitement from the children nearby. When your target gets in, the driver speeds off, stirring up dust as dogs scamper for safety. You follow. A call comes through. It's your boss. Falcon, what's the hold up, he asks before you can get the phone to your ear. Nothing, boss. I'm picking him up today. You've already been on this case for two days. I thought you were the best. And it continues. You do this, you do that. So the reader is meant to imagine himself or herself as the character in the story. Why? Were you experimenting in your long life of precocious <laughs> writing? It seems like a very difficult decision to have made to go for you. Yes, it was. Um, writing in the second person is one of the most challenging point of views to write from. And so this, for me, was an experiment to see if I could actually pull it off and, and do it successfully. And I'd like to think that I did that. Um, and precisely for the reason that you have stated is to draw the reader in immediately, and they feel like they are the ones in the story. So that was the intention. Right. Yeah. And then again, it becomes clear, again, how much do you want the reader to know, we know that there is spooky stuff here. Yes. And bad people, you know, sort of are going to be doing bad, bad things. things. I want to draw you on the notion, again, from my education of the twist. So the reader has already kind of the American expression, I know where you're going with that. It, we know where you're going with this. <laughs> what did you, what were you going to do to us intentionally at the end to finish it off? Well, I think the thing that I liked about it mm. was you had to fill in the blank at the end of what happened, because I just left it at a climax of sorts, right. but with no explanation of what happens next. Right. So leave so it up So your characters to... could have made common cause. Yes. They, they could have struck a deal. They could have. Right. This, which is another lead-in to a key word, the whole notion of, okay, it's all open-ended, mm -hmm. uh, the idea of a message. Yes. Do you write to communicate a message, or is it purely entertainment value, nice story, uh, or is the message, thou shalt not steal, or um, thou shalt, yeah. Yeah, in this story, it was clearly a message I was trying to communicate. Um, and when you read the story, which I hope you do, it brings you to a place where you have to confront your own feelings about this particular topic. It's a topic that Kenyans have had to grapple with, and now it seems that it's becoming more familiar in other places in the world. So how do you feel about this particular subject? And it's one that tears people and pulls them apart on both sides, and they feel very strongly about it. And I have, myself, even as I wrote it, I struggled with how I felt about what I was writing. Right. Yeah. My last question to you is, OK, it's printed. There's also the, the notion of, of continuation. It, it would be so nice to meet each of you individually and talk for an hour and a half about where we go from here. Yeah. But where do you go from here? Because surely you're not going to do the workshop again. Uh, do you feel that there are enough people here in this audience mm -hmm. who are going to be really watching out for something else from you? Or do you feel that we're in a sort of <laughs> uh, the, the state of writing? Because you want to write. Yes. Do you think you've got a, a, a made for audience? Do you think it's worth doing as a thing to do? 
I think ultimately, if, if writing is something you want to do, you have to try, at least try and do it. And that's been my goal, to at least get out and actually do it and then say that I tried it, even if it sucked, at least I did it. So yes, I hope you can expect something more from me. It's definitely in the works. Thank you, Sophie. Pressure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now, one of the idiomatic expressions is to say last but not least. So last but not least is Shiro Waweru with the story Wife Material. Uh, so let me find page 165. And I know there's a, a great thing going on with microphones and miking up. But um, Shiro is a student of business and IT, uh, now a transcriber and a freelance writer. And for her sins, she's multi-talented. You can sing as well. Yeah. You can sing. <laughs> yeah. How terrible. <laughs> I can't sing, uh, but um, wife material. I want to read a technique from you. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm not going to go from the beginning, if you'd allow me to. Okay. It says something like, um, there was no hope for guys like him who were nice but didn't fit the physical requirements. Mingina had taught him that lesson in the harshest way possible. That new guy was probably going to cheat on her and beat her up, but she thought she'd upgraded. And then, in italics, we have whore. In other words, you write some prose, and then you give the thinking of, the, of your protagonist. So spread across... They should hire more girls like her. Relax, you're getting ahead of yourself. And like, you, you know how, like in cartoons, the thought bubble is represented by little, little dots. So that's what's going on in the mind. Again, did McKenna said, say to you, put in some thought bubbles, honey, or you'll leave the course? Or, why did you do that? <laughs> no, no, she didn't. She didn't direct me in that direction but I felt that it was necessary to put it in that way, to put the reader into the protagonist's mind and to get them to see the, the protagonist's worldview. Right. And you're perhaps the only person, without giving too much away, mm -hmm. you're the person who has chosen to scare us <laughs> and make us afraid. I hope. <laughs> there are knives... Mm -hmm. Now, this is a very particular genre in itself. Uh, what do they call it? Horror or whatever? Uh, what led you to scare the fill-in-the-blanks out of us? Uh, it's fun, first mm. of all. Mm. Um, <laughs> plus, it was something I came across when I was just browsing the internet, as one does. Um, and I thought it would be fun to play around with it and see how it would manifest when combined with a lot of emotions and all that fun stuff. Yes, but there's, that was a leading question, mm -hmm. because for most of us, we have, because you're the last but not least, we have writers whom we have admired. Mm -hmm. And unless I'm terribly wrong, the first port of call is to try and write like somebody whom we admire. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put the I word influence. Mm -hmm. Who are your influences? Who... Would you like to write like and be like? John Grisham, Gogi Adiomo, Chinua Achebe, who's you? Um, in terms of genre, I'd say Stephen King. Stephen King. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I like to, I like the, the kind of horrific terror things, yeah. yeah, I like that. Okay, so you've got an influencer mm -hmm. used in a, in a different context. Mm -hmm. As a writer, did your influencer guide your structure? No. I In other words, are you, are you sort of trying to make people scared your way? Or is it you put in a little pili pili, <laughs> then some onions, then karanga, then people will be scared? I honestly didn't think about it much when I was writing that story. 
I just knew I wanted to do something with it and I wanted it to be, I knew how I wanted it to end. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what, who, who it would happen to yeah. or in, how, in what shape it would happen, but that's all I knew. So I just worked my way backwards from, from that. Your moment in the sun or darkness is going to come now because I'm going to read you the opening lines of wife material. Okay. Minor had swiped right on almost every girl on the app. He'd been trying to find a date unsuccessfully for the past year and had joined Tinder as a last-ditch effort. His friends were all paired up and he was often lonely, especially when they had group plans. He would never admit it to them, but he resented the fact that they no longer spent concentrated time with him. A girlfriend was always involved. So, dating app, we're seeing a we're dating app, and we think this is going to be a story about dating apps. Mm -hmm. And it turns out to be something totally different. Yeah. Uh, that threw me a wee bit. Why did you do that to me as a reader? Uh, <laughs> it's Why did you take me there and then take me there? <laughs> it's because generally the way it's set up is when people join dating apps, it's usually as a last resort because they've tried everything else and nothing is working. And, and people don't tend to really believe dating apps work. So when, by the time they're joining one, it's like, oh, okay, let me just try it and see how it goes. Okay, so you're saying that despite the dating app, uh, a candidate appeared out of reality, yeah. but the, the quest for the wife was real. Yes. I have to thank you on that note. <laughs> well, that's it for this particular episode of Mbogi Yama Writers, and there's one last thing, we all were in it together, so with social distancing as a norm, I'm going to ask our guests to all come on and take a bow.